Look, it's no secret I have a total man crush on John Saxon. So, when news of his passing hit recently, there was only one thing to do. Pay tribute to the man, the myth, the legend, with a review of one of his classic performances. This one's for you, John. Rest in peace. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling Antonio Margariti's cult classic, Cannibal Apocalypse. Released in 1980, Cannibal Apocalypse flips the Italian cannibal film script, bringing the man-eaters out of the jungle and into the city. It rips along thanks to unforgettable performances from the late John Saxon and the hardest dying man in showbiz, John Morgan, aka Giovanni Lombardo Radice. There's plenty of long pig on the menu in this one, which features more splatter effects from Gennetto De Rossi. But can Cannibal Apocalypse make you blow enough chunks to earn the coveted 5 barf bag rating? Let's get to the gore and find out. We fade in on some stock footage from Nom. Hey, at least it breaks with the Italian cannibal film tradition of opening in New York City. John Saxon. I like where this is headed. Wait a minute, screenplay by Jimmy Gould? That sounds bogus. Oh look, it's another Dardano Sacchetti pseudonym. I give out a lot of screenwriter credits on this show, but Sacchetti has more than all of you combined. And John Morgan? Look, let's just stop the video now. This is clearly the greatest movie ever made. You guys thought he was amazing because it gave you De Niro and Pacino? Well, Cannibal Apocalypse is basically like Hold My Beer and gives you John motherfucking Saxon and Giovanni Lombardo Radice. Game, set, match. And if you're keeping score at home, this is John Saxon's third Sick Flicks appearance and John Morgan's fourth. Down on the ground, these guys, who probably aren't even Vietnamese, are very alarmed by the approach of stock footage helicopters. And we find out why they're alarmed. Seems they've got John Morgan and Tony King caged underground. Morgan's like, well, this sucks, but at least no one's chopped off my penis and ate it in front of me yet. The good news for Morgan and his pal is that John Saxon is on the way. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Man, I love Richard Crenna and First Blood, but think how amazing it would have been if John Saxon had been Rambo's commanding officer. You can totally see it here, right? Saxon's like, you guys better put on your helmets and camo gear. Me? I'm just gonna wear my beret and be a badass. Directed by Anthony M. Dawson, aka Antonio Margariti. Margariti was a prolific, low-budget Italian genre filmmaker who directed over 50 films in his career. Oh, and he was sometimes credited as Anthony Daisies, and Tarantino is a big fan, paying homage to him in Inglorious Bastards and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Anyway, this Viet Cong camp doesn't seem so bad. I mean, they've got this friendly dog. Let's have a look. Get away! Oh, never mind. And now that the dog's dead, it's time for some funky mood music. Ah oh, yes, this makes Torch in the Village so much more relaxing. Who's ready for s'mores? Naturally, there's an ambush, but Saxon's got it under control. I think these Viet Cong eventually became stormtroopers for the Empire based on this shooting. Then this lady does her best Alicia Keys impression. Nailed it. Morgan and his pal are starving, and she's pretty well done, so they decide to chow down. Probably should have served her with rice or some other side dish, but beggars can't be choosers. Oh, the horror. The horror. With the enemy dispatched, Saxon and crew find Charlie and Tommy. Sorry, but we didn't order enough Vietnamese for all of you. But then Morgan's pal Tommy decides he'd prefer some authentic American cuisine and chows down on John Saxon's arm. But wait, it was all a dream. John Saxon, whose character name is Norman, decides he's going to need some medicinal aid to cope with his PTSD. Oh, while I'm down here, I might as well stop for a snack. I'm no food safety inspector, but leaving bloody raw meat dripping in the refrigerator doesn't seem safe or sanitary. Norman's like, I think I might need to go vegan. This keto diet's kind of grossing me out. The next day, Norman's wife is talking to his doctor. I always said you should have married me instead. Whoa, Doc, you're out of line. No one's picking you over John Saxon. Anyway, speaking professionally, 
I don't think you have much to worry about. It'll work itself out, Jay. For better, for worse. Is that your official diagnosis? Christ, I could get more detailed medical advice from Dr. Phil. Also, I like that they just randomly stopped in the middle of the road for this dialogue, then start driving again. Meanwhile, in another movie, John Morgan's skulking around this hospital for nervous disorders. Which is the nicest name for a mental hospital ever. This also seems like a good time to point out that Morgan's character name is Charles Bukowski. Okay, Bukowski. Keep your nose clean. Thanks. Catch you later. Way to be on the nose there, Cannibal Apocalypse. I mean, the only way this could be less subtle is if we named Saxon Ernie Hemingway. Look out! Our two movies are about to collide as Norman's wife and her doctor friend nearly run into Bukowski. How are things with you? I'm still searching for a soulmate. God, this dude just doesn't quit. Norman might need to lay the smack down on this guy. Back at Norman's place, he's teaching this kid how to fly his RC plane. Yeah, nice work, kid. The neighbor lady shows up looking to borrow a hairdryer, but this is all a ploy so she can make her move. <laughs> oh, I pulled a muscle during basketball practice yesterday. See, no woman can resist the raw magnetism of John Saxon. He shuts it down, then gets a call from Bukowski. Hey man, I'm thinking about grabbing a bite later. Wanna join me? I promise not to talk your leg off, but I might gnaw on it. Oh man, sorry Charlie, that sounds delightful, but I'm really busy. I gotta dry my hair. With no date, Charlie decides to go stag to the movies. Well, I was really hoping they were showing Cannibal Holocaust, but I guess a war movie will do. Hey, down up front. They're making out like this is the drive-in, and Charlie can't resist the urge to join in. Sure hope he didn't bite off more than he can chew. He flees, but don't worry, Super Mario is in hot pursuit. Seriously, this dude looks like what would happen if you'd cast Oliver Reed in a Super Mario Brothers movie instead of Bob Hoskins. Then it turns into an homage to John Woo's hard target as this guy on a motorcycle chases him down in a flea market. Bukowski ices him with the pump action, but there's no time for a celebratory feast on the corpse because Paul Blart, mall cop, is on the scene. And he demonstrates why you never send a security guard to do a cop's job. Man, Bukowski's gonna need a to-go bag at this rate. The real 5-0 do finally show up, led by this poor man's Lee Marvin, who's got no time for jibber-jabber. His name's uh, Bukowski, Charles Bukowski. Like the writer? Yeah, Dardano Sacchetti couldn't be bothered coming up with a more original name. Then the hostage negotiation starts. Charlie, come on out, man. I got a first edition of Post Office I'd like you to sign for me. I told you, he's not that Bukowski, Chief. Oh, right, right. And if you were worried we were going to have an Italian horror movie without Edward Mannix dubbing a voice, relax. The Vietnam vet. Barricaded in the flea market, taking pot shots at the cops outside. Of course, this bad news has Norman's wife convinced he's holed up in the flea market shooting cops. But he's not. He's just showering off after his afternoon delight with the neighbor girl. Meanwhile, Bukowski's like, things seem calm. I guess I can grab a quick bite to eat. I was feeling a little hangry. Meanwhile, Norman's off to lend a hand. I just hope Bukowski doesn't eat it. Also, there's no way I'm buying John Saxon drives a station wagon. They don't even have kids. Back at the flea market, Bukowski's working on a new haiku. I know we've only met, but you look so delicious. It's nice to eat you. He's even got booze, and it's yet another J&B whiskey sighting in an Italian horror movie. And with Norman about to head in, his romantic rival, Dr. Mendez, shows up too. Sorry, I'd have been here sooner, Chief, but I was busy hitting on Norman's wife. Then he offers up this observation. Don't you think that's a little risky? I mean, he could be killed. Shut up, man. If he's killed, you get his wife free and clear. Norman heads in, but Bukowski's a little trigger happy. Charlie? Pudgeon Lee Marvin's like, damn it, the mayor's gonna have my ass for this. Inside, Norman and Bukowski have a little heart to heart. You know what your problem is, Charlie? You're a fuck up. Well, yeah, and a cannibal. Norman talks him down. See? He really could have been Rambo's commanding officer in First Blood. Things are going great until Super Mario beans Bukowski with this fireball and then Bukowski bites this cop. Oh, Jesus! What did he do, officer? I almost bit off my finger! Probably better get a tetanus shot, man. Bukowski winds up back at the Nervous Disorders Hospital where he runs into his old pal from the cage in Nam. What are the odds? Also, why do I feel these two are up to no good? Well, oh, because they are. 
<laughs> Nurse Ratchet here lives, but she's been bit too. You all right? Back at Norman's place, we're basically reenacting an episode of Cheaters, only minus Tommy Grand. Listen to me. I mean, it's not what you think. That, that, that's not what I'm trying to tell you. While she was here, I... I had this urge to bite her. Well, okay, I guess biting isn't technically cheating. Later that evening, Dr. Mendez calls Norman's wife to offer up some exposition. I'm afraid he may have caught a form of contagious illness which manifests itself as a kind of rabies. So, wait. Norman and all these guys have some sort of rabies that makes them want to eat people? Christ's sake. That's the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. <laughs> no wonder Darno Sacchetti changed his name on this script. Jane, it would be better if you and your husband weren't alone tonight. Man, this is a weird angle to try to get a threesome going, Doc. Norman's wife meets with Mendez, who offers up even more exposition. I'll try to give you an example. When a dog becomes rapid, it attacks, and its bite is contagious. That's how the virus spreads. Uh-oh, the disease is contagious? I'm sure that's no big deal, right? But what I don't understand is how a social phenomenon such as cannibalism can become a contagious disease. Don't worry, we don't either. I'm pretty sure Darno Sacchetti is just making it up as he goes. Norman, meanwhile, is at the doctor. I don't want to wind up like Charlie Bukowski, doctor. What? You don't want to be a drunk poet? Why not? Down at police HQ, the virus is spreading. Remember that cop who got bit earlier? Well, looks like he's a fan of breast meat. Oh my god, son. Put it down. Things get even worse because it's spreading back at the lab, too. Nurse Ratchet is awake, and she looks hungry. <laughs> I guess he feels a little tongue-tied. For some reason, half the cast is riding in the ambulance with the cop who got bit. Who manages to scratch Mendez before she dies? I'm gonna be honest, that's probably good news for John Saxon's marriage. Cannibal Nurse, meanwhile, is freeing Bukowski and his buddy Tommy. Are you shocked that John Morgan hasn't died a horrible death yet? Yeah, me too. But not as shocked as I am to see that Norman has finally given in to his cannibal urges. The Donner Party flees in an ambulance, but they have to make a pit stop for road snacks. Mmm, scrambled legs. This is pretty much how I look while the turkey is being carved every Thanksgiving. <laughs> Say what you will about Bukowski, but his work with that saw is poetry in motion. They're back on the road, and it looks like everything is coming up Millhouse for them. At least until they run into Super Mario and the bikers. I want that motherfucker in the back seat! Stay away! Sure. Yeah, remember them? They're still in this movie, for some reason. The next thing you know, everyone is kung fu fighting. And that's probably bad news for the bikers, because John Saxon fought Bruce Lee. Things aren't going well for Super Mario, either. He gets his eyes gouged out. Bet he didn't see that coming. With the cops in pursuit, they head down into the sewer, where, I guess, technically speaking, this movie officially becomes part of the Chud cinematic universe. The police head down in pursuit, and maybe it's just me, but a flamethrower in the sewer seems like an explosively bad idea. Have these guys never lit farts before? Norman's wife heads next door to use the phone, but something seems off with these kids. Nurse Ratchet isn't really thrilled with the idea of going deeper into the sewer, so she makes a break for it, which leads to more dead cops. And if you thought John Morgan was somehow going to survive this movie, well, have you ever seen a John Morgan episode of Sick Flicks before? He dies harder than Sean Bean. <laughs> Write a poem about that, Charlie. It's a Hemingway pastiche. I call it A Farewell to My Intestines. Norman's been hit too, but he and Tommy keep soldiering on. Except Tommy goes kamikaze and gets roasted by the flamethrower. If you like your Psycho Cannibals well done, this one's perfect for you. Norman's the last man standing, and he's trying to get straight out the sewer like he's the third member of DOS FX. He does escape and heads back home. 
His wife wanders in and finds him in the closet putting on his army uniform. Look, whatever you do, honey, when I'm dead, don't hook up with Mendez. That guy's an asshole. Speaking of Dr. Asshole, he shows up at the house too. She runs to him, but if you guessed that scratch earlier has made him a cannibal, well, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. He actually manages to bite her, but then Norman blasts him. No one gets to turn my wife into a flesh-craving cannibal but me. Now that they're both infected, maybe they can give us a fourth season of Santa Clarita Diet. Or they can forge a suicide pact. Same, same. With the hoppers dead, that has to be the end, right? Well, not so fast. Remember those creepy kids next door? I feel a stinger ending coming. Yeah, there it is. Cannibal Apocalypse is one of the more bizarre entries in the Italian cannibal film subgenre, if only because it so radically flips the script from what we think of in terms of these films. Rather than another jungle adventure where the locals are cannibals, this film starts in the jungle but brings the cannibalism to a major US city where it spreads like a zombie plague. This, and the performances of the late John Saxon and Giovanni Lombardo Radice are what really make Cannibal Apocalypse one of the standout entries in the cannibal film cycle. Even if the idea of cannibalism being spread like a zombie plague is patently ridiculous. But enough about that. Is Cannibal Apocalypse splattery enough to earn a 5 barf bag rating? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, Cannibal Apocalypse delivers. We're treated to multiple bite wounds, multiple shotgun deaths, one severed leg, a bitten out tongue, Cannibal Flambe, and John Morgan dying hard yet again, having his guts blown out in the sewer. This is yet another Gennetto de Rossi splatter fest, and the quality and quantity of human carnage on display is good enough to earn this one four barf bags out of five. This is definitely a sick flick. Want to watch another video to celebrate the life and career of the legendary John Saxon? Then check out my review of Nightmare Beach. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.